Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Flink Forward, brought to you by Data Artisans. Hi, this is George Gilbert. We are at Flink Forward, um, the conference put on by Data Artisans for the Apache Flink community. This is the second Flink Forward in San Francisco, and we are honored to have with us Stefan Yuan, uh, co-founder of Data Artisans, uh, creator, co-creator of Apache Flink, and CTO of uh, uh, Data Artisans. Stefan, welcome. Thank you, George. Okay, so, with others, we were talking about the use cases they were trying to solve. But you put together the sort of, mm -hmm. all the pieces in your head first and are building out, you know, something that's ultimately gets broader and broader in its applicability. Help us now, maybe from the bottom up, help us think through the problems you were trying to solve. And, and let's start, you know, with the ones that you saw first and then how the platform grows so that you can solve more and more uh, a broader scale of problems. Yes, um, yeah, happy to do that. So I, I, th I think we have to take um, a bunch of step, a step backs and kind of look at what, what is the, let's say the breadth of use cases that, we, that we're looking at, how did that you know, influence some of the like, inherent decisions and in how, how we've, we've built Flink um, how does that relate to um, what we're where we presented earlier today, um, the you know stream processing platform and so on? So the start, starting to work on 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 Flink and, and stream processing. Stream processing is an is an extremely general and broad paradigm, right? Um, we've actually started to to say what, what Flink is underneath the hood, it's an, it's an engine to do com stateful computations over data streams. It's a, it's a system that, that can process data streams as a batch processor processes you know, bounded data. It can process data streams as a real-time stream processor produces real-time streams of events. It can handle you know, data streams as in sophisticated event by event, stateful, timely um, logic as you know, many Many applications um, that are, you know, implemented as you know, data-driven microservices also um, you know, implement their logic. And the, the the basic idea behind behind how 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 Flink takes its approach to that is just start with a just start with the with the with the basic ingredients that you need that, and try not to impose any form of um, like various constraints and so on around and around around the use of that. So, when I give the presentations, I very often say the basic building blocks for Flink is just like flowing streams of data, streams being you know like received from be that systems like Kafka uh, file systems, databases, or so. Um, you, you root them. You may want to repartition them, um, organize them by key, broadcast them, depending on on what you need to do. Um, you, you implement computation on these streams, a computation that can keep state. Almost as if it was, a, you know, like a standalone um, Java application. You don't, you don't think necessarily in terms of writing, writing state to a database. Think more in terms of maintaining your own variables or so. Um, sophisticated access to tracking time and progress, so progress of data, um, completeness of data. That's in some sense what is behind the event time streaming notion. You're tracking, you're tracking completeness of data as for a certain point of time, and then. To, to to round this all up, give this a really nice operational tool by by introducing this concept of of distributed consistent snapshots, and just just sticking with these basic primitives, you have streams that just just flow, no barrier, no transactional barriers necessarily there in um, between operations, no micro batches, just streams that flow, state variables that get updated, and then fault tolerance happening as an asynchronous background process. Now that is what, what is in some sense the, I, I would say kind of the core the, the, the core idea, yeah, and what, what helps Flink generalize from batch processing to you know, real-time stream processing um, to event-driven applications. And, and what, we, what we saw today is um, in, the, in, in the presentation that, we, or that I gave earlier in um, how, we, how we use that to build a, 
a platform for stream processing and event-driven applications. That is um, that's taking some of these some of these things, and in that case, um, I'm most prominently the fourth aspect, the ability to draw like sn application snapshots at any point in time, and and use this as a, as an extremely powerful operational tool. You can you can think of it as being a tool to archive applications, migrate applications, um, fork applications, modify them independently. And these snapshots are essentially your individual snapshots at the node level, and then you're sort of um, sort of organizing them into one big logical snapshot. Yeah, they're, they're, each node does its own snapshot, but they're, they're consistently organized into a, um, a, a globally consistent snapshot, yes. That has, that has a few, that has a few very, um, very interesting and Im important implications, for example. So um, just, just to give you one, one, one example where this makes really things much easier. If you have an application that, that you want to upgrade, um, and you don't have a mechanism like that, right? What is, what is the, what's the default uh, way that many folks do these upgrades today? Try to do a rolling upgrade of all your individual nodes. You replace one, then the next, then the next, then the next. Yeah. But that, that, has a, that has this interesting situation where at some point in time, you've actually two versions of your application running at Are the same running, time. Yeah, and operating on the, on, on the same sort of data stream. Potentially, yeah. Or on some partitions of the data stream, yeah. you have one version, and some partitions you have or, another version. So you yeah. kind of, you, you may, you, you may be at the point where you have to maintain two wire formats. Like all, all pieces of your logic have to has to have to be written in, in understanding both versions. Or you try to, you know, use a data format that makes this a little easier. But it's it's just inherently a thing that, you don't even have to worry about it if you have this consistent distributed snapshots. You've just a way to switch from one application to the other as if nothing was like shared or in flight at, at any point in time. It just gets many of these okay. problems just out of the way okay. instantaneously. And that snapshot applies to code and data, um, or can? So the by f in, in Flink's, um, in Flink's architecture itself, the snapshot applies first of all only to data, and that is very important. Yeah. Because um, what it actually allows you is to to decouple the snapshot from the code if you want to. Okay. And that allows you to do things like we showed earlier this morning. If you actually have an earlier snapshot where the data is correct, then you change the code, but you introduced a bug. You can just say, okay, let me actually change the code and, and apply different code to a different snapshot. So you can actually you like roll back or roll forward different versions of code and different versions of state independently. Or you can ah. go and say, I'm when I'm forking this application, I'm actually modifying it. That is that is a level of flexibility that um, that is that's in, in, incredible to yeah once you've actually once you've actually start to make use of it in practice is inc incredibly useful so and it's been it's been actually almost um, it's been one of the maybe least obvious things once you start to look into stream processing but once you actually start to production of stream processing this this operational flexibility that you get there is I would say very high up for a lot of users when they said, okay, this is why we took Flink to, uh, to streaming production and not others, the ability to do, to do, for example, that. But this sounds then like a, um, like with some stream processors, the idea of the unbundling the database, you have derived data, you know, at, at different sync points. Um, and that derived data is, you know, for analysis, views, whatever. But it, it sounds like what you're doing is, taking a derived data of sort of what the application's working on in prog progress and creating uh, essentially a logically, a logically consistent view um, that's not really derived data for some other application use, but for yeah. operational use. Yeah, so... Um, Is that a fair way to explain? Yeah. Um, uh, let, let, me, let me try to rephrase it a bit. Okay, when, when, okay. You, when you start to take this, this streaming style approach to things, which you know it's, it's been called turning the database inside out, unbundling the database, your input sequence of event is, is arguably the, the ground truth. And what the stream processor, what the stream processor computes is, is a view of the state of the world. Um, so while, while this sounds you know, this sounds in, at, at first super, uh, super easy, and you know, views, you can always recompute a view, right? Now, in, in practice, this view of the world is not, uh, it's not just something that's just like a lightweight thing that's 
that's only derived from the from the sequence of events. It is actually it. It's actually the it's the state of the world that you want to uh, that you want to use. It might not be fully reproducible just because either the sequence of events has been truncated or because the sequence event of events is just like too plain long to feasibly recompute it um, in a reasonable time. So having having a way to having a way to work with this um, in a in a very in, in a way that just complements this whole idea of you know like event driven log driven architecture very cleanly is um, is kind of what what this this natural tool also gives you okay so then help us think so that sounds like that was part of core um, flink that that is part of of core flink of flinks yeah inherent design yes. okay so then take us to the the next level of abstraction the scaffolding that you're building around it with the D da platform and how that mm -hmm. should make that sort of thing that um, makes uh, stream processing more accessible. How it, you know, it empowers a whole another generation. Yeah. So there's there's different angles to what the what the DI platform does. Um, so one one angle is just very pragmatically easing um, rollout of applications by having a you know having a like one way to. To, to integrate the you know the platform with your metrics alerting logging CI CD pipeline and then every application that you that you deploy with it just like inherits all of that like every um, application developer doesn't have to worry about anything they just say like this is my this is my piece of code I'm putting it there and it's just going to be hooked in with everything else um, that's not rocket science but it's extremely um, extremely valuable because there's like a lot of tedious uh, bits here and there that you know otherwise eat up a significant amount of the development time. The the um, like technologically maybe more um, like more uh, challenging part that this solves is the part where we're really integrating the like the application snapshot, the compute resources, the configuration management, and and everything into this into this model where you where you don't think about I'm running a Flink job here. That Flink job has created a snapshot that. Is running around here. There's also a snapshot here, which probably may come from that Flink application. Also, that Flink application was running. That's actually just a new version of that Flink application, which is the, uh, let's say, testing or acceptance run for the version that we're about to deploy here, and so on. Like tying all of these things together. Oh, so it's not just the artifacts from one program. It's how right. they all interrelate. It's, it, it, it gives you the idea of exactly of how they all interrelate, because an application over its lifetime, right? Will correspond to different configurations, different code versions, different um, different deployments on you know production A, B, uh, testing, uh, and so on. And like how all of these things kind of kind of work together, how they interplay, right? Flink, like I said before, Flink deliberately couples checkpoints and code and so on in a rather loose way to allow you to to evolve the code differently than. Um, and still, you know, be able to match a previous snapshot into a newer code version, and so on. Um, we make heavy use of that, but we we kind of give you a, a good way of, of, um, of first of all, tracking all of all, all of these things together. How do they how do they relate? Um, when was which version running? What code version was that? Um, having a snapshot so you can always go back and, and reinstate earlier versions. Having the ability to always, you know, move move an, a deployment from here to there. Um, like fork it, drop it, and so on. Um, th that is one part of it, and the other part of it is is the the, the tight integration with um, with Kubernetes, which which is um, like initially container sweet spot was stateless compute, and and the way stream processing as an architecture works is the nodes are inherently not stateless. They have they have a a view of the state of the world. This is this is this is recoverable always. Um, you can also, you know, change the number of containers, and you know, and with with Flink and other frameworks, you have the ability to kind of adjust this and so on, including but, the state, including re repartitioning the including, repart including repartitioning the state. But it's a it's a thing that you have to you have to be often quite careful how to do that so that this all just it all integrates exactly consistently, like the right containers are running at the right point in time. With the exact right version, and there's not like a 
there's not a, a, a split brain situation where this happens to be still running some other partitions at the same time or you're you're running this you're, you're running that that container goes down and is this you know is this a situation where you're supposed to recover or rescale like all, like figuring all of these things out uh, together this is kind of what what the like the idea of integrating these things in a in a very in a very tight way gives you so think think of it as, as the following way right you you start with and initially you start just start with docker docker is a, docker is a way to say I'm, I'm packaging up everything that a process needs you know all of, all of its environment to make sure that I can deploy it here and here and here and here and just just always works it's not like oh I'm missing the correct version of the library here yeah. or I'm interfering with that other process on on a port or so um, on top of Docker, people added things like um, like Kubernetes to orchestrate you know many many containers together, forming an, an application. And then on top of Kubernetes, there are things like um, like Helm or for certain certain frameworks, there's um, there's like Kubernetes operators and so on, which which try to to raise the abstraction to say, okay, we're, we're taking care of these aspects that this needs in addition to container orchestration. We're doing exactly that thing, like we're raising the abstraction um, one level up. To, to say, okay, we're not just thinking about the containers, the compute here, and maybe they're you know like local persistent storage, but we're we're looking at the entire stateful application with its compute, with its state, with its archival storage, with all of it together. Okay, let me let me sort of peel off with a question about sort of more conventionally trained developers and, and admins, mm -hmm. and they're used to databases for batch and request response type jobs mm -hmm. um, or applications. Um, do you see them becoming potential developers of continuous stream processing apps, or do you see it only for, mainly for a new, a new generation of developers? Um, no, I would, I would actually say that, that a lot of the like classic call it request response or cre call it like create, um, update, delete, create, read, update, delete or so kind of, you know, application working against the database. Um, there's, there's a huge potential for like stream processing or that kind of event driven architectures to, to help change this field. There's actually a, there's actually a fascinating talk here by, by the folks from DriveTribe who implemented an entire social network in this, in this, in the stream processing architecture. So not against not against a database, but against a, but against a log and a stream processor instead. And it it comes with some really cool, um, with some really cool properties, like um, a, ver a very unique way of, of having operational flexibility to at the same time test and evolve and, and run and do like very rapid iterations over your because of the decoupling because of exactly because of the decoupling because you don't you don't have to always worry about okay I'm experimenting here with something let me first of all create a, uh, a copy of the database and then once I actually think that this 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 is working out well then okay how do I either migrate those changes back or make sure that the copy of the database that I, I did that I bring this up to speed with the production database again before I switch over to the new version and so like so many of these things just like the pieces just fall together easily in the like in the streaming world would it um, I think I asked this of Costas but if you if uh, a business analyst wants to query the current state um, of of what's in the cluster yeah. um, do they go through some sort of head node that knows where the partitions lay, and then some sort of query optimizer figures out how to, you know, execute that um, with a cost model or something? Um, In other words, if you wanted to do yeah. some sort of batcher interactive type, uh, so there's 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 different there's different answers to that. I think. Um, there's first of all, there's the ability to look into the state of Flink, as in you know you have the you have the individual nodes that 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 maintain state during the computation, and you can look into this, but it's it's more like a a lookup thing. It's, you're not running a query as in a SQL query against that against that particular state. If you would if you would like to do something like that, what um, what um, what Flink gives you as, as the ability is, is always to, 
there's there's a wide variety of connectors. So you can, for example, say I'm 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 de describing my streaming computation here. You can describe it in SQL. You can say the result of this thing. I'm I'm writing it to to a neatly queryable you know data store and in memory database or so. And, and then you you would actually run the the like the the dashboard style exploratory queries against against that particular database. Um, so Flink's sweet spot at this point is not to run like many small, fast, short-lived SQL queries oh, more against, like against something that is in Flink running at the moment. That is that's not what what it is yet, yet, so yet the, built and optimized for. A, a more batch-oriented one would be the derived data that's that's in the form of like a materialized view. Exactly. So this this place these two sides play together very well, right? You have the more the more exploratory batch style um, queries that go against the view, and then you have the stream processor and streaming SQL used to continuously compute that view that you then that you then explore. Um, is there, um, do you see uh, scenarios where you have traditional OLTP databases that you know, are capturing business transactions, but now you want to inform those transactions or potentially automate them with machine learning, and so that you capture a transaction and then there's sort of ambient data, you know, whether it's about the user interaction or it's about the, um, um, machine data, you know, flowing in, and maybe maybe you don't capture the transaction right away, but you're capturing data for the transaction and the ambient data. The ambient data, you calculate some some sort of analytic result, could be a model, you know, score, mm -hmm. and that informs the transaction that's running at the front end of this pipeline. Is is um, that a, a model that you see in the future? So that that sounds like a former use case that has actually been run. Not not quite. Uh, it's not uncommon. Yeah, it's 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 actually in some sense a model like that is behind many of the fraud detection applications, right? You you, you have the transaction that you that you capture. You have a lot of contextual data that you receive from which you either build a model in the stream processor or you build a model off offline and push it into the stream processor as you know let's say a stream of model updates yeah and then you're using you're using that that stream of model updates you derive you derive your let's say your classifiers or your rule engines or your um, yeah just your your predictor's state from that from that set of updates and from the history of the previous previous transactions and then you use that to to attach a classification to the to the transaction, and then once once this is actually returned, this this stream is is fed back to to the part of the computation that actually processes that, so that transaction itself to to trigger the decision whether to, for example, hold it back um, or to to let it go forward. So this is an application. This is a application That's where people who have built traditional architectures would add this capability on for low latency analytics. Yeah, um, that's that's one way to, to look at it, yeah. Totally. As opposed to a rip and replace, like we're gonna take out our inner, our request response and our batch and put in stream processing. Yeah, so, so that is a that, that is definitely a way that stream processing is is used, that you you basically capture a change uh, a change log or so of of whatever is you know happening in a Either a database, or you just immediately capture the 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 events, the interaction from from users and devices, and then you let the stream processor run side by side the old infrastructure and just exactly um, compute additional information that you know even a a mainframe database might in the end use to to decide what to do with a with a certain transaction. So it's a way to to complement legacy infrastructure yeah. with new infrastructure yeah. without having to to break off or break away the legacy infrastructure. So let me ask in a different direction, more on the complexity that forms a tax for developers and administrators. Many of the open source um, uh, community products slash projects mm -hmm. solve narrow um, 
sort of functions within a broader landscape. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a tax on developers and admins um, and trying to make those work together because of the different security models, yeah, data yeah, models, yeah. Uh, uh, all that. So there is a zoo of yes of of systems and technologies out there, and also of different paradigms to do things. Once things follow, once once systems kind of have a similar paradigm or idea in mind, they usually work together well. But there's there's different philosophical takes. Give me on how give to solve me some problems. examples of the different paradigms that don't fit together well. Um, for example, when maybe one one good example was initially when when streaming when streaming was a rather new thing. Um, at this point in time, stream processors were were very much thought of as a just a a bit of an addition to the to the let's say the, the batch stack or whatever ever other stack you currently have. Just just look at it as a kind of an auxiliary piece to do some approximate computation and and a big a big reason why that was the case is because the there were the way that these stream processors thought of um, thought of state was with a different consistency model the way they thought of of time was was actually different than you know like the batch processors or the databases they, did which use timestamp fields and the, the early stream processors they couldn't handle event time exactly just use processing time yeah, and yeah. that's why these things you know you could maybe complement the stack with that but it didn't really go well together you couldn't just say like okay i can actually take this this batch job kind of interpreted it also as a streaming job once the stream processors got so a better the interpretation job. the old lambda architecture exactly so once the stream processors adopted a stronger consistency model, um, uh, a, a time model that is more um, more compatible with reprocessing and so on, all of these things all of a sudden fit together, fit together much better. Okay, so um, do you see that vendors who are oriented around a single paradigm or unified paradigm, do you see them continuing to broaden their footprint so that they can essentially take some of the complexity off the developer and the admin mm -hmm. um, by providing something that, you know, one throat to choke with the pieces that were designed to work together out of the box, unlike some of the zoos, you know, mm -hmm. with the perhaps the former Hadoop community. In other words, yeah. everyone seems to be trying to not everyone, a lot of vendors seem to be trying to do a broader footprint so that it's something that's, you know, like a, that it's just simpler to, to develop to and to operate. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are a few good efforts happening in, in, in that space right now. So one that I really like is the idea of like standardizing on some, some APIs. APIs are hard to standardize on, but you can at least standardize on semantics. Which is something that, for example, Flink and Beam have been very keen on, on trying to, you know, have an open discussion and, um, yeah, a, a roadmap that is very compatible in, in thinking about streaming semantics. This is uh, this has been taken to the next level, I, I would say, with the whole um, streaming SQL, um, with the whole streaming SQL design. Um, like Beam is adding uh, is adding Stream SQL and Flink is adding Stream SQL, both in collaboration with the Apache Calcite project. So. Um, very similar, like again, very very similar standardized uh, semantics and so on, ANSI SQL compliant. So you, you basically get a, you start to get common interfaces, um, which is which is a, a very important first step, I would say. Um, standardizing on things like... So SQL semantics are across products that would be within a stream processing architecture. Yes. and As an example. I, I, I think... This this will become really powerful once um, once other vendors start to adopt the same interpretation of streaming SQL and 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 think of it as yes it's a way to to take a, ch a changing data table here and project a view of of this changing data table a changing view a changing materialized view into into a different and into a different um, into another system right. And then use this as a starting point to maybe compute another derived view. So you can actually start and and think and think more high level about things. Think really 
relational queries, dynamic tables um, across across different pieces of infrastructure. Once you can do do some something like that, um, like like interplay in architectures um, be become become easier to to handle. Because even if you know, even if the even if on like on the runtime level things behave a bit different, at least you you start to establish a standardized model in, in thinking about how to compose your architecture. And even if you decide to to change on the way, you, you're frequently saved the the problem of having to to rip everything out and redesign everything because the the next system that you bring in just has a different a completely different paradigm that it follows. Okay, this is helpful. Um, to be continued offline or, or back online on the cube. Mm -hmm. um, this is George Gilbert. Uh, we were having a very interesting and extended conversation with Stefan Yuan, uh, CTO and co-founder of Data Artisans and one of the creators of Apache Flink. And we are at Flink Forward in San Francisco. We will be back after this short break. Uh -huh.